Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. All right. There's a big crowd today in the shul, eight people, me included. And uh, that with the presence of Zoom, all of those watching on Facebook, and with uh, the legions of angels of God who join us here today that we cannot see but are here nonetheless. Shabbat Shalom to everyone. Today's message is called The Mummy's Curse. <clears throat> now last week we finished Bereshit, book of Genesis. And this week we begin a new book of the Torah. The English name, as you know, of course, is Exodus. This comes from the ancient Greek uh, Exodus, which means way, the way out or departure. In the Hebrew, the book's title is Shemot, and Shemot means names. From the beginning words of the text of Exodus 1, 1, these are the names of the sons of Israel. And the, the Parsha, the portion of Shemot, covers Exodus 1, 1 through chapter 6, verse 1, and it tells of the Israelites' affliction in Egypt, the hiding and rescuing of the infant Moses, Moses in Midian, the calling of Moses, the circumcision on the way, the meeting the elders, and Moses before Pharaoh. And today, I want to explore that very last part, Pharaoh. I don't think I've ever been that deep into Pharaoh. I always focused more on Moses when it came to the early parts of Exodus, as I think most people do. They focus on the, the suffering of the Israelites, the, the cruel uh, and hard labor uh, imposed by Egypt and its taskmasters. Um, and today, as we explore Pharaoh in the sermon called The Mummy's Curse, I'd like to begin with a, a, a small amount of, uh, of humor. It says that uh, Egypt's pharaohs were so rich that some say it was because of a pyramid scheme. Oh. <laughs> anyway, humor aside, I wondered to myself, and I thought I would explore this, and perhaps uh, you may have different opinions of what I will present today, but these are my findings. I begin to ask this question. Who could Pharaoh, the pharaohs mentioned in the book of Exodus have been? And what can we learn from the curse associated with their reign. And there were things that I just could not ignore, and I feel compelled, compelled to share with you. You know, I recall an article some years ago about King Tut. The full name was Tutankhamun. And uh, the ancient Egyptian pharaoh and artifacts from his tomb were making a tour and would be stopping, uh, you know, in at like New York City, Chicago, other major cities to be displayed at one of the museums locally. And the article was intriguing in more than one way. Back in 1922, archaeologist Howard Carter uh, led a team that unearthed the tomb of King Tut. The article goes on to say shortly after the tomb was opened, Carter's canary was bitten by a cobra. A year later, Lord Cameron, the man who financed the expedition, died of an infection he got while shaving. You add the rumor that King Tut's tomb held a curse for any who would open his grave, and the media had a field day. By 1935, they claimed there were 21 victims of the mummy's curse. Now, they really had to stretch to get to that number, because only six of the 22 people present, well, only six of the 22 people were present when the tomb was actually opened, and, and they died over the next 12 years or so. Not a dramatic number, but because the supposed mummy's curse, because of the um, because of the supposed mummy's curse associated with it, and the interest that it aroused in the general public, Hollywood took notice. Now, from that day back in 1935 until this day today, there have been over 500 movies featuring dead pharaohs wrapped in burial cloth, wreaking their wrath on foolish mortals who dared to disturb their tombs. And the story of the curse of King Tut is interesting to me. And the reason it's interesting is because 
there really was a curse associated with his family. But the curse didn't affect the people who opened the tomb. And it didn't affect King Tut. And if I'm right, it affected his father, his uncle, and his grandfather. Tut's mother was Nefertiti, one of the famed beauties of ancient Egypt, and his father was a pharaoh named Amenhotep IV. Amenhotep was not quite as famous as King Tut, but he caused quite a stir in his day because he made a major change in the worship style of the Egyptians. You see, Amenhotep took what had been a worship of many gods, polytheism, and forced Egypt to worship only one god, monotheism. Scholars are divided as to why Tut's father made this dramatic change, but you can be assured it wasn't real popular at the time. People didn't like changes in their worship back then any more than they do now. In fact, Amenhotep's design was so unpopular that once King Tut took the throne, he immediately changed Egypt back to the many gods that everybody seemed to want. Amenhotep IV, King Tut's father, was the heretic king of Egypt. He wanted Egypt to worship only one god, and that alone, that alone is worth interest. But even more intriguing to me was the fact that Amenhotep IV wasn't actually supposed to be Pharaoh. That title should have gone to his older brother, Thutmose. And Thutmose was the firstborn of his family, and he died mysteriously. No one seems to know why. Hmm, thinking caps are on. To my way of thinking, though, this family sounds a lot like one that might have suffered from a curse. A curse known as the tenth plague of God upon Egypt. In Exodus chapter 4, part of our parsha today, verses 22 to 23, it, God told Moses to say to Pharaoh, This is what Adonai says, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I have said to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will slay your son, your firstborn. Now, I could be wrong, but since King Tut's father, Amenhotep IV, was the second born and he became Pharaoh because his elder brother, the firstborn, had died of unknown causes, and since he decided, once he became Pharaoh, to abandon the many gods of his family for one god, my guess is that Amenhotep was probably the second born son of the Pharaoh that defied God in the Exodus. One can sort of visualize what transpired. Amenhotep IV would have seen the failure of Egypt's many gods, and he would have known firsthand that his family's gods couldn't save his family. And in bitterness, he would have abandoned them for a more powerful god. You see, you've got to remember that in the story of the Exodus, it wasn't the firstborn of, the, of just the, the peasantry of Egypt that were killed in the 10th plague. But even the firstborn son of Pharaoh was affected by that plague, and he also died. So naturally, he couldn't become Pharaoh if he was dead. It would have to be the secondborn son. It could not be the firstborn, because the firstborn died. Now, what was this Pharaoh thinking? What was his sons thinking? If one God were good enough for Moses and could save his people and the many gods of Egypt, powerful as they thought they were, could not save Egypt, that may have been in the mind of this Pharaoh. One God, albeit not the God of Scripture, could be enough for this Pharaoh. And if that's true, that would make King Tut's grandfather, Amenhotep III, the pharaoh of Egypt during the Exodus. But note this, though. Ramesses II is considered by many to be the pharaoh of the Exodus. However, a more conserv the more conservative timetable by scholars for Exodus, which is circa, circa 1400s BCE, predates Ramesses by over 100 years before his birth. So there's kind of a timetable problem with that. But don't get lost there. 
Aminutep IV was the son of Aminutep III. Aminutep III was a powerful ruler who ruled Egypt for nearly 40 years. His reign was one of the most prosperous and stable periods in Egypt's history. But Aminutep III suffered from a curse. His son, his firstborn son, died mysteriously. Let's review. If King Tut's grandfather, Aminutep III, was the pharaoh during the Exodus, then Tut's father, Aminutep IV, would have become the next pharaoh sometime after Israel left Egypt, if you're with me. And King Tut himself would have restored the ancient practice of polytheism, multi-god worship, once his father died. Did we get that? Israel leaves Egypt. The Pharaoh at the time changes now to one God worship. But then King Tut comes along as Pharaoh and he changes the practice back to the worship of multiple gods. I want to make sure we're clear on that. But we still have one Pharaoh we have not identified. Who would have been the new king or the new pharaoh who did not know Joseph in Exodus chapter 1, the beginning there. It was the pharaoh who didn't know Joseph. Who was this? See, Moses returned to Egypt at the age of 80. So pharaoh who ruled when he was born had long since died. So who was this first pharaoh mentioned in Exodus who did not know Joseph? If my math is right, that might have been Tut's great-great-grandfather, Thutmose the third. That most the third loved to build things, great monuments, temples, and cities. And according to Wikipedia, he built over 50 temples, including what is now known as the great ruins of Karnak. And that kind of building would have required a lot of labor, slave labor. Slaves like the Israelite slaves. In addition, Thutmose also hated people, passionately hated people who were not like his people, the Egyptians. Years before Thutmose became king, Egypt had been taken over by a foreign people called the Hyksos. Now, the Hyksos ruled for about 110 years, but the Egyptian people never warmed to these new rulers. And they didn't fit in, and they weren't like the Egyptians. They lived differently, they ate differently, and they worshipped differently. And eventually the Egyptians overthrew these foreign kings. And when Thutmose became king, he decided to completely remove any remaining threat of the Hyksos, and he mounted 23 military campaigns to finally destroy whatever power they had left. He was a mighty warrior that some have called the Napoleon of Egypt. And like I said, he hated people who were not like his people, like the Hyksos, for example and perhaps like the Israelites, because they weren't like the Egyptians either. They lived differently, they ate differently, and they definitely worshipped differently than the Egyptians did. Now, many conservative scholars believe that Joseph came to Egypt during the reign of the Hyksos. Thus, Israel would have been identified as being part of the hated rule of those foreigners, and thus, the most the third would have sought to destroy Israel because he saw them as posing the same threat the Hyksos had over his beloved nation to change the way they lived, they worshipped. So this is how it would have all played out, according to some scholars. In this view, Thutmose the third was the new king who did not know Joseph in Exodus one verse eight. Aminotep the third, Thutmose's great grandson, was the pharaoh during the Exodus, chapters 3 to 14, Aminotep IV was the second-born son who became Pharaoh due to his brother's death and who forced Egypt to worship only one god. King Tut was the king who brought Egypt back to worshiping many false gods. Now, that's nice to consider, but you might ask, what difference does that make? And what difference does that have? What does it have to do with me? Who cares, really, what happened thousands of years ago? You know, this is today. It's 2021, the Hebrew year 5781. What do I care what happened back then? What does this have to do with me? Well, actually, it has to do a lot to do with you. And you might ask, as I said, what difference does that make? Well, I'm glad you asked. 
It makes a difference because there are many people of science and other so-called quote-unquote scholars, excuse my French, out there who would like you to think that the Bible is unreliable. They'd like you to think that you can't trust it, that it's historically inaccurate. Moses never parted the Red Sea. They just got very low in tide and they were able to walk through it. It was only ankle deep. That is, authors borrowed from other cultures to arrive at its theology. For example, they'd like us to think that Moses didn't come on the scene of Egypt until nearly 200 years later. And therefore learned his theology there from being only one God from Aminotep IV, rather than from the other way around. Can you imagine that these scientists and other scholars who don't believe in the Bible account, they want you to believe that Moses learned about faith in one God from an Egyptian pharaoh. This view was first suggested by the famed, uh, by the famed uh, man of the uh, science of the mind named Sigmund Freud. Why would these skeptics believe this? They believe it because they don't believe in the God of Israel, the creator of all. And since they don't believe in him, they need to explain how the Israelites could have, how the Israelites could have lived in such a polytheistic world and still ended up worshiping only one God. And that one God that they worship freed them from a powerful Egyptian ruler with an army. How did this happen? Religion evolved to say that these scholars and that evolution progressed from polytheism to monotheism, so they say. And so their way of thinking, since there is no real God, then men had to make him up. But there is a real God, and his Bible makes no errors in telling its history. Archaeologists have used the Bible for more than a century to roadmap to find cities and civilizations that have been long buried by the sands of time. What document did they use to find them? The Bible. There is no other religious book of any kind in the history of the planet capable of that kind of accuracy. God didn't give us the Bible as a history book, though, but it is historically accurate. And you can depend on it to be correct even in the smallest of details. And I believe God didn't do that just with the Bible. I think he left us kind of a trail of crumbs in history, crumbs of evidence pointing back to his word, constantly going back to what he says. Evidence like the lives of King Tut and his father, Aminotep IV. I want to shift gears here a little bit. The mummy's curse was a curse of God's judgment upon Pharaoh's house. Ever since the days of Thutmose III, this new king that did not know Joseph, God had been at war with Egypt and its gods, its false gods. The Pharaoh had arranged to kill the babies. God hates the murder of babies in any, any form whether they are still in the womb or out of the womb. God hates the murder of babies. Amen. Amen. Those out there that support that, their heart is motivated by one thing, and that is pure, unadulterated evil. Pharaoh had arranged to kill the babies of the Israelites. And so God would not only free his people from their slavery, but would bring judgment upon all of Egypt and especially upon the house of Pharaoh by taking Pharaoh's firstborn son. This was payment for Pharaoh ordering the death of the Hebrew baby boys. When the confrontation in Egypt, chapter 5, takes place, which is also part of this portion, 
Moses came into Aminotep III's throne room and asked permission to take Israel out of Egypt, to take them away. But in Exodus 5, verse 2, Pharaoh answered, saying exactly this, pay attention. Who is Adonai that I should listen to his voice and let Israel go? I do not know Adonai, and besides, I will not let Israel go. Well, over the next weeks, God showed this Pharaoh just who he was and why the Pharaoh should let Israel go. He brought ten terrible plagues upon Egypt, and the last of those plagues was the death of the firstborn, including the firstborn of Pharaoh himself. The only exception to this was in the homes of those who had applied the blood of a lamb on their doorposts. Now what I found interesting in this part of the story was Pharaoh's comment. Who is Adonai that I should listen to his voice? And as I pondered on that phrase and I, I was stuck there, it occurred to me that this was exactly the same attitude that the adversary had toward God. Why should I listen to him? Who is Adonai that I should obey him? In Isaiah 14, verse 13, we're told that the adversary had said in his heart, You said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mountain of assembly in the far north. Who is this supposed God that I should bow down to him? Hasatan was thinking. I'll take him down from his throne and then I will be God. And if you read your scriptures, that's exactly what his plan is. To sit in the place of God and call himself God. To have there one who is righteous and doing good and to replace him with someone who is evil. That is always the plan of the adversary. It occurred to me that Pharaoh was a type, if you'll be with me in this, Pharaoh is in this way kind of a type of adversary, a type of Hasatan himself. Pharaoh was to Israel what Hasatan is to us now. You see, Pharaoh, he held God's people in slavery, and he was known for his cruelty. Pain, punishment, and death were in his hands. And he owned Israel. Moses had to ask him permission. And in the same way, before we all became believers, before anyone became a follower of Yeshua the Messiah, believing in him, giving our lives to him, surrendering to him, before that, Hasatan held us in slavery. He was known for his cruelty. Pain, punishment, and death are in his hands, and because of our transgressions, he owned us. However, Yeshua brought us back, back from the abyss, back from the death, back from a future of darkness. Now follow me here. Colossians 1 verse 18 tells us that in his death, burial, and resurrection, Yeshua was, and I quote, the firstborn from the dead. Read it for yourself. Colossians 1 verse 18. Yeshua was the firstborn from the dead. It says it. What are we supposed to do? Skip over it and not pay attention? No question, no puzzlement, no thinking about that verse? You see, by his resurrection, Yeshua opened the gates of hell and freed us from death's power. He freed us from Pharaoh's power, from Hasatan's power, from the adversary's power, from death's power. And just as death of the firstborn heralded the freedom of Israel, in Exodus, so also the death of God's Son, His firstborn, heralded our freedom. And in His death and resurrection, He brought us our freedom. Purchased it. He paid for it with His blood. As I'm winding up to my closing, let me share another thought. 
There has always been, for me at least, maybe not for you, a troubling aspect of Israel's relationship with Pharaoh, and this has always puzzled me. You know, once they crossed the Red Sea, or the Yam Suf, the Sea of Reeds, for the next 40 years, whenever Israel ran into difficulties and hardships, almost every time, guess where the people of Israel wanted to go back to? That's right, Egypt. They'd always talk about going back to Egypt. Mmm, was so good over there. In Numbers 11, we're told that Israel began to be bored with their diet. They wanted more variety, more meat. And so they said, in Numbers 11, verse 5, We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Wow. Sounds like welfare. Yeah. Also, the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. Yummy. They All of a sudden, they forgot having their backs opened up with whips, bleeding, sickness with no cure, hard labor every day. All of a sudden, they forgot this. They'd forgotten the bitterness of their slavery when life didn't go their way and they were tempted to return to their old way of life. I mentioned this for a purpose because this happens to some messianics and also Christians. It happens. They become bored with the faith and the practice of their faith or they face troubles that shake their faith. And they long for how life had been before they knew the Messiah. Wasn't it easier back then, you know, in Egypt? And some even returned to Egypt in the ways they were before. They leave their congregations. They lose their appetite for the Bible, for God's word almost everything. And because they turn back, they deny eternal life and they embrace the curse. I want to say that again. Because they turn away from God's calling and they turn back to where they were before they knew Messiah, they deny eternal life and they embrace the curse. Remember that article I mentioned earlier on? Well, when Howard Carter and his associates found the tomb of King Tutankhamun, they opened up a casket, and guess what they found? Guess what they found when they opened it up? They found another one within it covered with gold leaf. And then they opened up the second casket, and guess what they found? They found the third casket. And inside the third casket, guess what, the, what was there? There was a fourth casket made of pure gold. And Pharaoh's body was in the fourth, wrapped in gold cloth with a gold face mask. Wow. Such money, such beauty, such amount of time and effort went into crafting four different caskets, one fitting inside the other, all inlaid with gold. Sounds nice, doesn't it? But when the body was unwrapped, it was leathery and shriveled. You see, no matter how elaborate the caskets were, no matter how beautiful the sarcophagus, no matter how lovely the wrappings, what lay within was death and only death. And no matter how they tried to preserve their bodies or take their wealth with them to the quote-unquote other side, the pharaohs couldn't escape that final curse, the mummy's curse, the curse of death. But through Messiah, we who believe have escaped. Hebrews 2, verse 14 through 15, follow with me. Therefore, since the children share a common physical nature as human beings, he became like them and shared that same human nature so that by his death he might render ineffective the one who had the power over death, that is the adversary, and thus set free those who had been in bondage all their lives because of their fear of death. And I don't know anybody who's not afraid of dying. 
Messiah freed us from that fear. He freed us with the knowledge that we're not going down there with the guy from the land of the extra crispy. We're going up there with him. Yeshua, the Son of God, King of the Jews, died and was buried and rose from the dead to free us from that curse. And once you have Yeshua, you can no longer be affected by the curse of death, the mummy's curse. It has no power over you. When God freed Israel from slavery, Pharaoh had no more power over them. They were gone. And he tried to attack them afterwards, remember? He took his army with the chariots and spears and whatnot, and he chased them down, and what did God do? Closed the sea over them, and goodbye Pharaoh's army. Pharaoh had no more power. What was he going to do, write them a letter? Would you like to come back and be slaves again? I mean, come on, let's be friends. No one brought me my coffee today. When Yeshua gave his life for us, by choice, willingly, not by force, they didn't grab him, chain him, beat him, strangle him, but he could have broke free at any time. By choice, willingly, he went. And then the curse of death, that mummy's curse, no longer could touch us. The adversary had no more power over us. Death has no more power over us. We were slaves at one time in our lives. All of us were slaves at one time in our lives. We were slaves to sin. We were enslaved by it. We couldn't break it. It was kind of like a scene from the old TV show, Can You Top This? Only it was, what, what sin can I do next week? Because that, that sin I've been doing in like a couple of weeks in a row. What, what can I do that's going to top that one? Is there a better one? What's more evil? What can I get away with? So let me close this way. Because of Messiah's sacrifice, we are finally, whether we realize it or not, we should, we are finally free. We are free forever. We are living forever. And we are always, always citizens of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Shabbat Shalom.